good good afternoon. Depending on what part of the world you're in, that's the uh, the one amazing thing about uh, the internet and webinars is that we have to uh, communicate with people from around the world. So we appreciate you taking the time. With the thing we share with you today, the information will be helpful for you and in your and uh, we're happy to to continue to answer questions after the seminar. If you have especially challenging questions or you need need more help, um, Steve and I are here in American Fork, Utah, which is in the Rocky Mountain region, in Eastern United States. And you can see the building that we are in at the base of the Wasatch Mountains. Um, warm day. It's uh, probably uh, well, 30 degrees outside, or expected to be um, this afternoon. So, <laughs> uh, I, uh, as Steve said, my name is Michael Coleman, and uh, I'm the uh, well, sir, I'm the director of temperature metrology. Uh, the, the technically, I'm the um, corporate temperature metrologist, and I've worked. At Oak slash Heart Scientific for um, actually about 18 years now. I should have I should have updated this slide. And uh, it's really neat. Just uh, a couple ago, I was in, in Europe, at Poland for the Temp Miko conference that happens every three years. I was able to talk to a, gen, a gentleman from Poland who who has attended one of our web seminars on when we discussed thermal couple calibration. I thought that was I was really to be able to to someone who who, who has ended one of these one of these webinars. So, all right. Um, today we're uh, well. We'll just go to learning objectives really quick. We're going to just quickly review some principles of uncertainty analysis. And unfortunately, that that's almost the that's a that's all a whole day discussion really to talk about uh, on the analysis. Um, but we'll do at least what we what we need to know. Um, sense of the couple anti analysis that we will be presenting. Luckily, it's been simplified down, and so we have to have too many concepts to be able to put together this uncertainty analysis. Start going through the components of a typical thermocouple calibration. Um, certainties involved in that. Until we will be talking about how to convert voltage accuracy, because so so much of the that like you know the routes used to measure thermal measure voltage and are specified in units of voltage. So we will an important concept knowing how to convert voltage accuracy to temperature accuracy. Talk about references and additional sources of uncertainty. The Kelvin system that will be the focus of our discussion is the one shown here where we have a um, Horizontal uh, furnace that, that, that go up to 1,200 degrees Celsius. In the scenario, we are calibrating type S thermal couple that is suffice to meet AFTM specifications. We'll, I'll go through more detail on this in a minute. It's just that I have the I have the picture here to show you, and that you under test thermal couple being or checked against a reference thermal couple that, it, that has been calibrated by fixed point or has a, a, um, a little lower uncertainty and as a reference thermometer. Um, these thermal couples are being measured with a Fluke 1986A uh, DAC. Um, it's not an instrument used for, for at the reference level for thermocouple calibration, but it has um, some specifications that are a bit complicated. Um, so we wanted to choose it to help you understand, you know, how to apply specifications. It, it certainly is a worthy instrument of being used for calibrating thermocouples. Just the particular calibration. Um, it um, well, you'll we'll see what I mean. We we'll, it. It does. It does a good it, it job uh, for sure. So, um, and specifically, the ho the horizontal furnace is a ninety one eighteen A model ninety ninety one eighteen A. 
Um, we already talked about the 1586A. Uh, the 1586A also has a, a multiplexer or scanner attached to it. So the red thermal couple will be measured by on channel one on the 1586A itself, but the E thermal couple will be measured on this um, stack multiplexer, which is more uncertainty when when the scanner. We'll definitely cover that in detail. For the ending in improving the uncertainties in this calibration system, there there are other type of equipment out there that would would help improve different um, parts of uncertainty analysis. For example, a stirred liquid bath will have uh, advantages, but only, but has a limited temperature range. May only go up to three Celsius. Um, a portable after dry block calibrator like the one shown here is, is very common in industry, especially in on-site or into calibrations. And then in place of a reference thermocouple, a high temperature PRD with, with much less uncertainties could be used for the temperature reference. A high precision uh, voltmeter like this uh, 8508A would, would improve voltage uncertainty. We have technician um, doing a similar calibration, but is uh, using a, a fluke black thermal readout, which has uh, a little bit better specs than the 1586A that we're, we are reviewing here. But but the main point to include with this slide is that the uncertainty analysis that we are predicting is general and be easily adjusted to accommodate any of the equipment that we were showing here, the, the principles are the same, then we'll just be slightly different. See, just a few more details on the calibration that we're we are discussing here. Um, this is a comparison type calibration. Um, the T is a type S thermocouple that is um, be verified to meet ASTM E230-02 uh, application for a type S thermal couple with the degree of plus or minus 1.5 degrees C or 0.25% of reading. And um, if we were performing this calibration, we'd be measuring it at several different temperature points. Um, at one Celsius is is where we are. We will be focusing for our uncertainty analysis. And in just like I, I just a couple of minutes ago, um, the, we'll, we'll be study uncertainty analysis at 1,000 degrees Celsius, but the principles apply at the other temperatures. Just have to adjust the numbers slightly. Um, a couple of other notes here. The reference probe will be using an external reference junction using an ice bath, which is traditional or typical for a reference thermocouple. Um, but the UT thermocouple not have a reference junction attached, and for the it will be uh, reference junction, or the reference junction is actually inside of the readout. Um, in if you were in a calibration scenario where you wanted to have optimum uncertainties, then have an external reference junction for both the reference probe and the UUT. In this case, we wanted to demonstrate. How to calculate uncertainty for both types of reference junctions: the external ice bath type reference junction, and the internal in the readout reference junction. Okay. Um, here's a uh, a quick at the certainties that we will be going through. Concerned about know which one of these are because we'll, we will go through each line one at a time in great detail. And by the end of our 45-minute discussion, you will be familiar with what these uncertainties mean. Um, we'll give you a, a couple of key points in uncertainty analysis. Again, this is not meant to be a complete how on uncertainty analysis. And, and one of the things 
I find with uncertainty analysis is depend person the, or the opinion it may vary a bit. Um, there's no exact method of calculating may certainties, but certainly the ability required in being thorough and and using numbers and and, uh, and it helps to be creative uh, in in the uncertainty analysis approach to make sure the Cal system will work correctly. A couple of things here is uh, uh, we um, will combine the uncertainties. We want them to be in normal distribution form as shown here in this Gaussian curve. But the uncertainties that we will be discussing are expressed in regular distribution as shown here on the right. In normal distribution uncertainty, which we do have a couple this way, we have to know what the um, um, or the, uh, the typically they are expressed in an expanded form, like for example, k equals two or nine percent. So what the coverage factor is? If we know what the coverage factor is, then we just divide by the coverage factor, convert the entity to a standard uncertainty, so it can be combined with other uncertainties. So in the case of k equals two, ninety-five percent uncertainty, we write it by 2, turn it to a k equals 1 um, uncertainty. With a regular distribution uncertainty, oftentimes uh, specifications like limits, like a drift limit of a regular distribution. And if that's the case, then we divide it by the square root of 3 to turn it to a standard uncertainty. A tip here is if it's not clearly understood what the distribution is for an uncertainty that you are looking at, then assume that it's rectangular. That's a that's a conservative thing to do. It it reads a slightly larger number, but that that's the the advice for situations like, for example, if you have a an incident, an annual user's guide doesn't make it clear if this vacation is k equals to distribution or what it is. You assume that it's rectangular and by the square root of three. Okay. We'll talk about measurement noise was to the measurement of the reference probe and applies to the measurement of the UT probe. Measurement noise is, is the certainty attributed to the noise of the measurement system. So measurement noise we have a result of instability of the heat source, so the first instability, and so any electrical noise that may be occurring in the measurement system. The thermal couples, especially, it, it's uh, um, noise can be a significant issue and challenge in situations. Um, you have to be careful with things like ground loops. Make make sure that everything is grounded properly. Um, but ultimately. The principle related to taking multiple readings. Never, uh, it's always uh, practice whenever in every calibration scenario to take more than one reading so that a mean can be calculated rather than just a single single reading. Um, and then we would like to measure at least 30 readings on the reference probe to calculate the mean temperature that the reference probe is indicating. One that, then calculate the uncertainty associated with the observed standard deviation. So, in this example, um, we have standard deviation limit of 0.05 degrees C. And because we've taken 30 samples, our things, we, we divide that standard deviation value by square root of 30 to calculate the uncertainty or the standard deviation of the mean. Is then zero zero nine degrees, and, and this is the uncertainty associated with with, with the uh, standard deviation of 0 0.5 degrees C. In our we prefer to set a a noise limit or standard deviation limit, so that the technician can identify if the system is working properly or if the standard deviation is being exceeded. The technician knows that something is wrong, and 
the calibrate system has to be investigated. Um, laboratories, though, will uh, will not have a measurement noise limit. They'll measure the samples, calculate the mean and standard deviation, and directly and enter the standard deviation that is measured at that point in time. And it's certainly an acceptable, acceptable practice too. It would be important in that scenario to um, make sure that it's clearly understood what um, typical performance is in case they them is not working correctly and the nose is significantly larger. Uh, 86A has statistics built in to calculate the mean and standard deviation. And I think it even has a, a, a built-in calibration program that will communicate with the furnace. Steve, that, I, I think it's built to communicate with at least some of the uh, flow temperature equipment. Oh, it will control the furnace to move to different set points um, and t take data at each set point. But so that that helps. So you don't have to use us for something to calculate measurement standard deviation. Well, applies to both the reference probe and the UUT probe. <clears throat> so, um, certainty experts may be um, um, uh, scratching ahead a bit about the way we're expressing the numbers for measurement noise here in one and A two. Usually, the um, noise or standard deviation is just in at sigma level, but occasionally I do see um, laboratories express it at two sigma or two standard deviations. Um, but, uh, here we're going with both, but clearly, in my experience, it's just a k equals one. Okay, standard statistic <clears throat> it's required to use a check standard, um, uh, but in a Calibration process where you are calibrating a temperature probe, either use a check standard um, to represent um, term effects that may occur in the calibration system, or, or UUT uh, T repeatability. If you don't use a check standard, then there's an obligation to understand the term that can, that can occur in the calibration system. Specifically, um, the repeatability of the UUT. Um, so notice that we, we, as we continue through this uncertainty analysis, we don't have ability for the UUT. Uh, now, now we're, re we're referring to short-term repeatability of the UUT. Um, and as the check standard that we have chosen is the same as the UUT. It's another. It's a type S thermocouple, and so if we Incorporate rings from a check standard unit. And you here, and well, actually, I'll just go there right now. Um, we chart here showing that we've taken standard unit. Every time we've measured the 1,000 degrees Celsius point, we recorded the, the temperature that we've observed on the check standard unit, and we've in this chart. Then we can take the data and calculate the standard deviation of these. Uh, measurements. Standard deviation is the check standard statistic. It, um, now, probably dominated by non repeatability of the check standard itself, uh, but it also will have effects that um, a system that are difficult to identify. Um, so, so, the unknown uncertainties are hopefully covered by measuring with a check standard. So, that's why check standards are, are important. Can, they will help you with that, but more importantly, the standard is a nice way of helping helping someone see that the process is working correctly. This not, not be as you see or identify by just looking at the reference probe. So, in as operation systems as possible here at Fluke, we want a check standard probe. That's uh, so exactly what we're showing here. When you put the check standard reads in a control chart, very easy to see if the process is in control or not. Uh, these control lines happen to be at, at a k equals two 
or two sigma of the standard deviation that you see over here on the right side. Um, some laboratories prefer to, to check standard limit lines of k equals 3 or, or 3 sigma. Um, it's a bit conservative to use k equals 2, but laboratory, our policy is that if a check standard reading exceeds one of these control limits, the outer lower bound, then we stop and investigate, and we don't accept that we it's required that the the measurement is repeated to until it is is in control or the problem investigated and and Roz is identified. So, so that was that's check standard statistic. We're going to move on to a little bit more complicated topic, and that is the uncertainty do readout accuracy. Um, or its capability to measure voltage. The, the 1586 is used to measure both the reference probe and the UUT probe. So uh, the same calculations apply. There is a slight difference between these, these two scenarios. So so we will we will them here. Um, the calculation that we will be using is converting the 56A's um, voltage uncertainty or its voltage accuracy spec, depending on what's described in the user guide, uh, to a uh, temperature uncertainty. And we do that by divide by the Seebeck coefficient at the temperature that we're interested in, or the term for Seebeck is the sensitivity of the probe or slope of the probe. It's uh, voltage versus temperature slope aperture that we are interested in. So that's the key point, is where you are calculating the accuracy of a voltmeter, you have to know, you have to choose which temperature you want to make the calculation at, and go look at the um, unit under test, the, the probe unit under test volt at that temperature. So in this case, we are measuring a type S. Uh, if you don't have the, the coefficients for the for your type S thermocouple or whatever thermocouple you're measuring. That's an important principle here is that, that all thermocouples are, all different letter types are slightly, have slightly different voltages and different Seebeck coefficients at different temperatures. So the, the type and temperature, then you go to the, the either a caption report table like we have here, or you can go to the NIST tables on the NIST um, website. That has um, volt temperature tape for all, all so well, maybe not all letter types thermocouple, but at least sure the, the main popular types. <clears throat> and you look at the table and you find the temperature that you're interested in. So in this case, we are interested in 1000 degrees C, shown right here is the 1000 degrees C row here, and here voltage at 1000 degrees C. Thermocouples are linear enough voltage output that you can either choose to play, um, the change in voltage for between one and one, so value here, here versus one thousand. Um, calculate the difference between these two voltages, or you could even calculate the difference between one thousand degrees C and nine hundred ninety-nine degrees C. If you experiment with that, you'll see that. Um, is uh, very uh, similar. Um, sometimes people will, will do both and calculate the average so that they they get the slope, you know, uh, that then that is the slope right at 1,000 degrees C. But I think find that, that it doesn't make any difference on the final result. So here we show the, the numbers. It's kind of small, so I apologize for that. Um, but we find that the Seebeck coefficient for a type intermodal couple at 1,000 degrees it's 0, 0,115 millivolts per degree C. And also important too, sometimes these tables will be in microvolts. The, the NIST tables may be microvolts. I, I can't remember. For sure. This is in millivolts, so, so keep that in mind. Okay, so here we have a copy of the specifications for the 1586 voltage accuracy. And it says in the paragraph that accuracy is given at plus or minus percent of measure. 
measurement plus a lower voltage value microvolts. So if we look at channel one, it has a voltage accuracy of 0.004% of the measurement, a floor voltage of four microvolts. And using one of the scanner channels, we had two microvolts to that. Um, if we're using fast measurement mode, then we have to add additional uncertainty. Well, if we're not using fast sample rate, we, will, we don't have to worry about that. And then there's also specification that if you're using the unit outside of the 18 to 28 degree ambient, the additional uncertainty would be added, which in this case, we are in a controlled environment, so we don't have to worry about this spec. Then next, um, we'll look at the reference junction accuracy. The um, visual or the scanner that I showed you that's, that's on top of the 56, the CJC accuracy of 0 0.25 degrees C. Um, there's also a high capacity module available, and it has CJC accuracy of 0 0.6 degrees C. The high capacity module, is, it looks a lot like a board. Um, and uh, so let's go ahead and start plugging these numbers in to see, see what we get. Um, so I best thermocouple, sorry to repeat, but the, uh, the, the details here that are that I we are diff are hard for you to keep track of as we as we talk. So um, there's 1,000 degrees C. So the voltage is 9.6 millivolts. We don't have to worry about full vision on the voltage at this point. This is just a calculation. Um, so so first we take the 9.6 millivolt reading and we apply it to the uh, the fillet that describes the accuracy of the instrument, which is 0.004% of readings. So take 0.04% multiplied times 9.6 millivolts divided by 100. The 100 removes the percent. And then we add the of 0.004 millivolts. Um, and that uh, then divided by 2, because the manual tells us that that was a K equals two space, and, and that gives a result of 0 0.002 millivolts, 0022 millivolts with a K equals one. And now we to temperature by dividing by the thermocouple Seebeck or sensitivity coefficient at 1000 degrees C. So we go a little bit further. And is where we're doing that. 0 0.0022 millivolts divided by 0 0.0115 millivolts per degree C. The volts cancel. We're left with degree C 019. Okay. There, there it is right here on on row B1. That's the let's read out. Or sorry, uh, it's the readout measuring the ref probe. Um, did the same calculation for the UUT probe, and it's here. here um, but we had to uh, remember as the UUT is being measured on the scanner or the deck, there's another 0 0.002 microvolts additional uncertainty that was added, and, and so now you can see that effect here in temperature. Worry about having to go through these calculations so quickly. Um, we have a short period of time, um, but as you've said, these slides we sent out to you so you can, in your time, go through these calculations and practice with them for the thermocouple lead types. Um, next, we'll be talking about the other component uh, related to the readout, and that is the ref junction. And that's as we for UUT will be using the internal reference junction, but but let's start talking about reference junctions in general here. Um, it's a, it's an important concept. This is material that we in a, in, a, in another webinar talk about the principle of how thermocouples work. This is just a quick review of material that is in that other webinar. So. so 
apologize if you haven't attended that other webinar or, or are not very familiar with how thermal couples work. Um, but uh, here's a preview at least. Um, thermals, in order to measure them, there there has to be two measurement junctions. One junction is where the thermal couple wires are together, and this is often referred to as the hot junction or the measuring junction. We've identified it as T1 in this station. A and B are the two different wire types that, that comprise or this wire is com composed of, or sorry, this thermal couple is composed of. And then a two is the cold junction or the reference junction. And this is where the thermal wire is then joined with they're directly with copper connections in the readout, or copper wire is attached. Uh, junction is transitioning from thermal wire to copper wire, and the copper wire is, is then connected to the voltmeter. Actually, the voltmeter is, is made of high quality, so there are no additional junctions that are significant to the rest of the measurement system. And that's one of the components of a thermocouple measurement is that um, the equipment has to be built and, um, in a way that, that um, results in just two junctions. And so, when we measure thermocouple voltage, it's basically the diff uh, it's the result of the difference between these two junctions. And so, a key here is that both junctions contribute to the measurement. So we are calculating. Um, rest junction uncertainty, we need to consider the, the places temperature sensitivity or the Seebeck coefficient of both T2 and T1. So let me show what that looks like. Uh, here the uh, uh, high capacity module card that I mentioned earlier. Um, to uh, show you kind of, you know, in general how reference junction circuits work. Hard to see, but that arrow is pointing to a little thermistor temperature sensor that's in the middle of this board. Here on the left and over here on the right are our terminal our connection terminals where thermocouples are connected to this circuit board or this high capacity module. Um, it does have a cut on it, so that helps it have an ideal thermal temperature uh, in this unit. But although this thermistor is a, is a bit of a dis away from these junctions over here and the junctions over here. So that's where the uncertainty comes from, is it's difficult to measure the temperature of that junction. But that's the key here is that we, we need to know the temperature of, of this junction so that we clearly state for it. So sometimes these are called um, reference junction compensating circuits. So more of a schematic diagram showing the temperature sensor, which is the temperature of vectors here where we connect thermocouple wire to a copper, which is connected to the wiring system and goes to the op amps and everything that are inside of a, volt, a voltmeter. So an internal reference junction. Now, they typically, they typically have much higher uncertainties than a controlled reference junction like external reference junction, where we are a normal couple wire shown here in red and yellow. That is yellow, right? I'm a little bit colorblind, so okay, so nodding. So that is, uh, it could possibly be green in my in my eyes. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure we're talking about the same wire here, as so everyone understands. Um, um, the normal couple wires connected to copper wire, and then. Where that action happens, we put the connectors down, the connect junctions down inside an ice bath um, of ice and water. So it's a nice environment, and we have a very nice control of this junction, and we can reduce the uncertainty. Here we have a, a Van Duer flask that we use in, in our lab, a, a thermocouple reference junction. Let's now look at the math involved here. I briefly mentioned earlier, 
when you're calculating the uncertainty of a reference junction, you need to consider the sensitivity of the temperature of the measurement junction and the temp sensitivity at the temperature of the reference junction. So, see what that what we mean. By that. Um, and they're looking at an external reference junction or an ice bath. And already included, ice bath has an uncertainty of plus or minus 0 0.025 degrees C. That's a conservative number for an ice bath that is using just typical tap water, at least that's what we have here we are in Utah, as ice baths can be maintained quite easily within this temperature just using um, regular tap water. Now, of course, you can reduce this uncertainty by using ice that's made with distilled water and carefully preparing the ice bath so that no um, impure entering into the interest in the water. Um, but but the 0.025 uncertainty is quite adequate for, for, for what we're doing here. So um, we also put a thermistor probe in our ice bath just to check it and make sure that it's always working correctly. Um, so it's the uncertainty of the, the of junction ice bath. I need to look at the sensitivity of the thermal couple. So we are still measuring at 1,000 degrees C, so we remember that the, uh, the sensitivity is 0 0.0115. We calculated this earlier. Um, and the temperature of the reference junction is 0 degrees C, so we have to go up back to that same chart that we looked at earlier and find a CBEC or activity coefficient at 0 degrees C, which is quite different. It's 0 0.0054 mils per degree C. Now we plug these two um, key values in formula, it basically creates a ratio of the reference junction over the measurement junction sensitivity, and multiply that ratio times the entire reference junction bath or ice bath. So our 0 0.025 degree reference junction bath and 0 0.012 degrees C. And there's a rectangular so, so by the square root of three, so we get 0 0.007. Now we're going to do the same thing for our internal reference junction. The for the internal reference junction is 0 0.25 C. So uh, it's larger ice bath. And apply the same, same principle we get by the ratio of the of the two sensitivities. Keep in mind, in this case, so the ref junction is at 25 degrees C, not zero degrees C. So we have to go out and get the activity at 25. It's, it's slightly different. Um, but, uh, we end up with a uncertainty of 0 0.07 equals 1. Pushing here a little bit. Just, uh, I'm not saying that I'm a little behind the schedule here. So. <laughs> um, but but uh, hopefully, though, this is... Um, this makes sense. I'm talking about the readout. So, so we just have two more principles to talk about here. Uh, so let's focus on the reference probe. So, um, we'll talk about the calibration uncertainty of the reference probe. So, in this, the reference probe was calibrated in a fixed point calibration process, and, and we know the uncertainty at several different fixed points. Um, now, we're 1,000 degrees C, which is not a an I-90 fixed point. So we have to know how to calculate the uncertainty at 1 degree C. Um, um, a rule of thumb for that is that you look at the two surrounding main uncertainties in the calibration report and the larger of the two surrounding. Um, I recommend that you always um, to the Cal Lab that, that calculates your your rinse thermal couple, and for their advice, if if you don't already know how to calculate the uncertainty at these in between temperature points, in this case the uncertainty is 0 0.2 degrees C. So when we divide that by two, we get, um, 0 0.13 degrees C. Um, 
we plugged in here on, for B5. Let's talk about another uncertainty related to the reference probe, and that is long-term drift. The ref thermocouple is a fluke thermocouple, so we have a specification for it that says that it uh, has a long-term stability of 0 0.5 degrees at 1100 Celsius and degrees C at 1450. Um, it'd be really difficult to determine term drift of thermocouples because they, they can vary a bit. Um, so of course, the two have the couple calibrated a few times so that you can start seeing how much risk between each calibration. Uh, it's possible that you use some, some other method of verifying or monitoring your, your reference thermocouple, like a point cell is, works very easily, like a, an aluminum cell is at 160 degrees C. Um, definitely measuring the triple point of water or the ice bath um, on a reference thermal couple really doesn't help much because it's so com so different than measuring it at, at high temperature. Um, at any rate, though, we determined from monitoring our reference thermal couple from calibration to the next that we have a drift limit of 0 0.1 degrees C at 1,000 degrees C. So divide that by the square root of 3. So our drift uncertainty then is 0 0.06 that we will be plugging into our uncertainty analysis. So you here for B6. Now finally, uh, we arrived at our last uh, source of uncertainty here. Well, I've listed it here. And related to the heat source itself. So we're using a horizontal furnace. For calibrating thermocouples and you know the horizontal configuration, and um, we're analyzing a furnace to be used in a calibration process. The the two main specifications that you're concerned about are axial unity and radial uniformity, and these two numbers describe how consistent temperature is throughout the. Uh, area inside the front where, where we measure. So it's just a simple diagram showing this concept of, of two probes that are being compared with each other, and there's a reference probe that the that the and I'm concerned about the two the probes that are be, being compared with each other. You know, maybe that one is a reference probe and the other is a UUT. But we need to know how can that temperature region is. Where these, where these probes are measuring at. Um, we look at the actual numbers. Furnaces, there are, uh, well, concepts here. Um, there are days of using a furnace. Um, on the side here, we have an open cavity furnace with, with slightly larger unit uncertainties. To reduce the effect of those uh, larger uncertainties, the reference probe is bundled with the under test probes. It's kind of hard to see in this picture because it's kind of small. But this is a bundle of thermal couples that are all tied together and are being inserted inside the furnace. It's a little bit challenging trying to determine what the unity is in the area of, the, of this bundle. Uh, is to use a, an equilibrium block or the block. Well, there are different people out of different terms to describe basically a thermal mass that helps improve the uniformity of temperature side of furnace. And say four hole block that's been used on the right side. I have to keep in mind that a furnace, when you are transitioning from one temperature to next, the furnace will reach slightly. Uh, four uh, settles into um, its uniformity. This graph here is showing two probes that are sitting inside of a furnace, and the furnace is ramped from room temperature up to uh, 100 degrees Celsius. 
and it shows that the furnace overshoots a little bit. Uh, the reference probe, is, its chart is in red. The T, oh, sorry, the cavity probe. Um, this was a an experiment on one of these furnaces being used as a, a with with an open cavity. So there was a probe um, in, the, in the rear of the furnace, um, and uh, at, at any rate, so two different probes are inserted in the furnace, and they. Uh, well, sorry, the the reference probe becomes quite stable. Quickly, um, notice that the probe, the line in blue, is still a higher temperature, and it took um, another hour or so for to to actually equate um, to, to you know the best uniformity that we would see in this case. And so, so time stories are in such a hurry to measure. Tools, the uh, the furnace stabilized for maybe twenty or thirty minutes, and it looks like it's nice stable. But the problem is, is the uniformity hasn't and uh, minimized, or you know, it hasn't equated yet. So that in mind. Okay. Um, so now talk about numbers. The furnace is specified have um, it's. We we find the radial uniformity and the axial uniformity. Um, I'll see. Let's cut to chase here. Um, when we want to find out what radial uniformity is at 1,000 degrees, we we'll do some interpolation work because over here in this table of uniformity specified at 300, 700, and 1,200. Um, in this case, we can we do near interpolation between the specs at 700 and 1,200. And it tells us that, that at 1,000 degrees C, the, the radial uniformity is plus or minus 0.3 degrees C, K equals 2. So we did it by 2 to get 0 0.12 to C, K equals 1. Um, you should have measurements yourself. You should never re I have confidence in these specs that we buy. In cases, if you verify it yourself, you'll find that it's actually a little bit smaller. Um, but you always want to check the numbers yourself to make the, the furnace working correctly. Um, axial uniformity is described as the uniformity in the the of the measurement well, and its same value over the entire temperature range. So that makes it easy. So we don't have to interpolate or anything. And at 0 0.2 degree 2. And uh, so self making a noise for some reason. Um, so actual uniformity is describes the uniformity in the in the in the pulse of the furnace. And it's in this case it's specified over the bottom sixty millimeters. Would provide an area in case we can't get the uh, jumps, all the thermocouples to match up perfectly. So we'll take these two numbers and them into the uncertainty analysis. And now that we are finishing that, we can combine the uncertainties. So let's talk about how we combine them. Um, these uncertainties are independent uncertainties. So we combine them using RSS or uh, the square root of the sum of the squares. Uh, we have dependent or correlated uncertainties, then we we just add them using linear addition or we mathematical there you know in more sophisticated uncertainty analysis you may have to use a mathematical expression that describes how how the these interact with each other. Um, but at any rate, uh, we have two uncertainties that are correlated. This is where we use the fifteen eighty six A volt accuracy to measure the probe and the UUT probe. So, so those two uncertainties are added only and are assessed. Um, so let me go and show you. So total uncertainty expanded, K equals 2, is 1.04 degrees C. Um, um, a couple to see if it meets its ASTM specification at one 
130, and the GM spec tells us that it's um, 2 5% of that temperature. So two specifications, plus or minus 2.5 degrees C. Vibration uncertainty is 1.04, then that gives a TUR of 2.4. So that's dividing the UUT tolerance by uncertainty of our calibration process and gives us 2.4. The rule of thumb is um, you want to have a TUR of 4 to 1. We're not quite there yet, so, so the guideline that we recommend is that you use guarding um, scenario to ensure um, 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 calibrate. Uh, so with that, um, we'll just quickly mention a few other uncertainties. We we don't address triple inhomogeneity in the analysis. This is an important concept, and I need to think of a way to incorporate it in this. Um, it, it kind of is incorporated because that the uncertainty for the reference probe um, 0 0.26 degrees C and a significant portion of that is the inhomogeneity of the reference probe. Um, in a in a which it's accounted for, but but homogeneity is critical for the UUT also. So we we recommend that you at least check your your UTs for inhomogeneity and reject them if they show signs of having inhomogeneity. Uh, in their webinar. So we'll talk about thermocouple principles. We, we we have suggestions on how to make thermocouple in homogeneity. Uh, extension wire, then you have to be, consider the environment. If a room that you're measuring in has more uh, than a one degree C difference between the, the endpoints of the of the wire, then you need to add additional uncertainty. So with that, oh, earlier I mentioned some with better specs, um, here are some, some numbers related to that equipment, like the Fluke 265 reference sample um, readout. Um, you'll pull the internal RD accuracy is 0 0.05 versus 0 0.25 for the 1586. Um, you can also use a reference PRT instead of a reference thermocouple, and that helps reduce the uncertainty significantly. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Steve, and uh, then we'll eventually into question and answer. Oh, thank you, Mike. Before we get into questions, there's um, a slide that you're seeing here. There's some additional useful references and links there that you may want to make note of. And I mentioned before, I'll send out the slides so you can and, um, you'll have the details on that. So we're ready now to take questions. We've already received a few. If you have additional questions, please text those into the host of the chat window, and we'll answer those now. So why don't we get started on a few of these questions then? The one is, could compensating instruments such as a thrice cell replace reference junction ice bath and add uncertainty for the calculation? So maybe a uh, triple point of water. Um, um, oh, I've met you a few times. Hope you're doing well. Um, so, um, can use uh, uh, se several different options for for functions. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's Testing? back. It's back. Okay. Yeah, wish the internet. Sorry about checking. that. Okay. Um, so I was just saying, I I recognize your name, Tommy. And hope you're hope you're doing well. I've met Tommy a few times. He's been here in American Fork for some seminars. Um, there, coaching instruments such as a triple point cell uh, reference junction. Okay. There are several options for. For uh, replacing an ice bath, because an ice bath is a bit of a pain to work with. You have to ice and get you know get everything clean, and you know it, it's more work. So there are a few options. There, Fluke makes an instrument 
um, I think it's called a, 90, a model 9101. It's, it's a drock furnace that, that operates at zero degrees C and it's designed specifically to work as a reference junction for thermocouple calibrations. I guess I should put it on the side. Um, but you also use any other dry block calibrator type furnaces that, that will provide zero degrees C. Zero is nice because you don't have to do any corrections. If, if you have a, a reference junction that's operating at zero, that directly take the voltage that you measure and, and apply it directly to the thermocouple tables to invert to temperature and stuff. Um, so I, I use a triple point of water cell. It's really different. It's at 0 0.01 degree instead of zero degree C, but you know, such like a difference usually not a um, some labs may not even apply correction for it. Um, and then you can use, I've heard of some laboratories using a gallium cell. Is at 29 degrees Celsius. And I've, but that one is a little trickier because you have, then you, you do need to apply a correction if you're using gallium. Um, and laboratories will use a variety of other things too. They will they may have a, a block that's sitting at room temperature and they, they measure the temperature of it with a thruster. So, uh, absolutely, there are several other ones for reference junctions. Okay. Here's a question from Carl. He says, what do you use to tie the probes together for testing in a furnace? That's a, I, th I think there were a couple, a couple earlier. There was a picture where yeah, yeah. we had a bundle of thermal couples. You may want to go back to that one. So people, yeah. This right there okay, so this picture on the left is, is a bundle of thermal couples. Um, I've heard a couple of different materials, like um, some laboratories will use platinum wire or some type of high temperature wire that um, won't melt at the temperature you're making at. Um, uh, I think NIST, I, I saw where they were using plat platinum wire, but that can be kind of expensive. Um, and you can also buy, there's a braided um, fiberglass material. I, I I forget what the name of it is, but but strong enough. It's not super strong, but it's strong enough to to thermal couples together. There's also a a thin, um, again similar. It's a it's a it's a woven glass material that reminds me of medical tape, but it doesn't have an adhesive on it, and and it's a wrap. You can just wrap it around. The thermal can kind of tie them together. It's almost like a ribbon made out of. Uh, woven, woven uh, fiberglass. I, I think it's fiberglass. Okay. Our question is from Zach. He says, do you include related resin uncertainty for the reference hand UUT? Uh, good question. There are some very strong opinions out there that resolution should always be included. In this case, um, uh, the resolution of the readout does go well beyond its specification um, are covered by just using its specification, but there are there are side outs that um, the play resolution is is directly linked to the accuracy of the instrument, or, or can be a limiting factor. I, I for for, for comprehensive, I should just go ahead and put it in the uncertainty analysis just to show that it's that it's insignificant. But but yes, that is that it, that is a common. Um, some uncertainty. Um, in the case, it wouldn't be a significant contributor, but that anyway, I, it's a good, good point. Our news from Frank. Do you end use of manufactured HRPs for copper to form a couple connections for your external reference junction? Is there a check required for them? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what a TRP is. If you have a minute, can another check or I am to, uh, just what TRP stands for? I, I, that be referring to a. Um, there are. Um, Omega TRPs make the, the a cup of copper cushion in that probe. Oh, okay. All right, so um, yeah, look at those a little bit. There, are, there are some ASTM guidelines for for handling those situations. Um, 
and typically the thinking of you you have to calibrate you have to calibrate it and um and to, and then find out what uncertainty is um and something that but if but now you mentioned that omega makes it it makes me think that Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. I was on the wrong path there. Um, so, um, the point connect the couple wire to copper um, and put it in ice bath. The main certainty is the ice bath itself. But you, but you talked about with the furnace, you have to consider the uniformity of the bath, make sure that there's enough immersion. And again, that the, the ice bath is uniform. Um, so we've had to see that in our ice bath to a total of 0.025. Um, you would have to do something similar here with with situation, but but possibly Omega has some specifications that apply to, to the connector. Uh, but I'll, after we get done, I, I want to. I'm going to go to the website and look at those and make sure I, I understand what's what's happening there. But I but I think the I think the, the certainty there would be would still be the ice bath itself if this is, it was working the way I think it works. Okay, questions from John. If we had uncertainties to the for the volts measurements because the standard new UT using the same instrument, why don't we add the uncertainties of the heat so uniformity? Well, that's a good question. Um, the, the furnace uniformity is describing the difference between the, the potential difference of temperature that, that, that the UT versus reference may be seeing. So so that's it's incorporating uh, this for both. The, the furnace uniformity itself describes that can see of the temperature between the reference and UUT. Good question, though. Good, good detail. Okay. John also texted in. We were talking about the tying material. He's saying Kapton is the tying material. Oh, uh, yeah. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Just make sure that it um, um, can, you know, you're calibrating all the way up to 1200 Celsius. I, I can't remember the top end of Kapton. Usual range, but I, I do. Yep, yeah, that is one of the terms. I thanks, thanks, John. I would really appreciate that. Okay, move to our next question from Stan. Processing equipment when evaluating a thermocouple connected to an analog to digital input card. Most OEMs will spec the reference in degrees Celsius, but tech support cannot specify the confidence. Most appropriate approach to assume a rectangular distribution. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would I would dare is just assume rectangular. Yeah, what factors when they are pushed on something they they will often say oh, it's normal distribution k equals two, but tricky. You know, you you guys know how it is trying to navigate specifications. Uh, so so I would assume rectangular in that case. Okay. Next question is from Mark. Did include the room temperature uncertainty? Um, we, we did. Um, if we we briefly mentioned for the the, the uh, is is uh, the instrument mostly affected by room temperature? And specification that we use covers the route in a room from twenty plus. Or over the range 23 plus or minus 5 to be um, If we were made out in the field somewhere outside of that range, then the, the specs do have a method calculating um, a deal uncertainty for, for for temperature if, if it's inside the 23 plus or minus 5. Uh, fortunately, the furnace uh, is care if the if the um, well, I'll say that, it, it's, but first, it's not very, it's not impacted significantly by um, ambient conditions. If an ambient is unstable, the room temperature is going up and down quickly. Um, furnace stability could be impacted. 
<clears throat> the uh, typical uniformity, which which is mean value we take from this, this it's, not a, it's not impacted by by the and that's the same thing for about the reference junction. Hopefully, it's insulated and isolated away from room temperature. The next question is from Armin. It says, please may tell me if I pipettes, should I use their uncertainties that's best on them or measure it practically? I want to measure the whole uncertainty of a method that was developed in our laboratory, for example, and there are very equipment. Is there any easy way to generate data because some equipment don't have any references about that? Yeah, sometimes you have no choice but to use manufacturer specifications or lines written by reputable laboratories like, like NIST or NIST or, or your own country's NMI. Um, we, we have some examples in, in our laboratory where we it's simply not practical for us to try to go measure the uncertainty ourselves. Um, there are conceit checks that that you can perform in a laboratory. You can do your own intercomparisons um, to show that um, separate devices equivalence within their uncertainties. Um, you can check standard measurements. You know that there are a lot of there are other methods of of keeping an eye on those situations where we're practical to to do a study on each instrument. Um, or, in, or you may be skeptical, possibly, of manufacturer specs. But and of course, you you, you have to in the case you have to very carefully look at the manufacturer specs to make sure that there aren't uncertainties that the manufacturer. You know, for example, the a manufacturer may give you a specification that only applies at 23 degrees C and apply over a range of ambient conditions, or or uh, with a pipette, this may not apply, but maybe different elevations to, um, you know, if you're doing pressure calibrations, then you also have to consider um, the difference in elevation. Um, but the point is, is just making sure that, that if you do use the measurement, uh, the manufacturer's uncertainties, that, that the manufacturer has a good reputation in the business and that you compare those numbers with, um, reported by labs like NIST to make sure, you know, if, if your uncertainties are 10 times better than NIST uncertainties, then there's probably something wrong. All right. Our next question is from Mohan. How about the homogeneity test of the unit under calibration before the calibration? But that, I mean, the immersion depth and the range. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, and homogeneity is a very complicated topic. Um, I'd recommend that you have uh, um, papers out there that are available through Metrologia or the International of Thermal Physics, where laboratories have, have done a lot of work trying to study in homogeneity. Um, w one problem in homogeneity is that you do tests to see the effect of inhomogeneity, but very, very difficult to then say probe has zero one degrees uh, due to inhomogeneity. These uh, illustrations with inhomogeneity is varies. They're kind of describing here varies with the depth, the gradient region of where you are measuring at. So that's why. One one thumb is um, view of of our uh, webinar is a test that I have to admit we well uh, we don't, don't use laboratory we we have a, an inhomogeneity test we do in a zinc cell if a couple exceeds the limit we have for it, for inhomogeneity then we we reject it but it's it's complicated because it's it's really only it, you know our test only checks one small section of the wire. It doesn't check the entire the entire length of the wire um, for, for thermal couples or you know industrial or thermal couples. 
guidelines recommended by the New Zealand NMI, and we and we have a link to their website in one of the slides at the end of this presentation. Um, they have some good practical on their website. Um, but at any rate, though, you put a thermocouple, you clamp it on a table, you put a table on some, in some clamps, and then you use a heat gun and uh, move the heat gun along the length of the thermocouple wire and, and you have the thermocouple connected to some kind of readout or voltmeter and you just watch for big changes in, in temperature as this on the readout. Um, well, then people always ask, well, what do you mean by big changes? Um, and I, I don't have a good answer for that. It, 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 part of it depends on what you're willing to put up with in your in your calibration. Um, but for example, though, if, if I was doing this test at room temperature, the thermal couple jump by a half degree, uh, some inhomogeneous section of wire, I would probably just reject it because new, new properly working basal thermal couple should not have a half degree uh, inhomogeneity um, that's, that's in this test. So, um, we're, we're, we're trying to develop some more advice for, on that to try to help you guys out with, with trying to make sense of, of inhomogeneity. All right. Next question, Mike, is from uh, <clears throat> He's asking, how do you link the thermocouple and copper wire together? Uh, good question. Uh, we, in our laboratory, we actually solder the wire to the copper wire. And we try to make the the, the joint as small as possible. Uh, we'll limit it to about three or four millimeters. Um, so we we uh, you have to make sure the copper wire is clean and that the thermocouple wire is clean, um, shiny. You twist the wire together just a little bit, maybe two twists, and then you just put a little dot of solder to them. Um, other laboratories use um, a solder like for a reference junction. Almost everybody just uses solder because it's so much. It's easier to to work with versus spot welder. Um, we've even seen some laboratories. This isn't very common anymore, but I, but still have them in some labs. In the last few years, they're called mercury cups, and it's basically a a glass tube with a little bit of mercury at the bottom, and you just shove both wires, or you push both wires down inside, and it's uh, the connection between the the two wires. And the laboratories really like it. They're they're very sad that mercury is being taken out of their laboratories, but a, but it's in a clean way. You don't have to worry about if you if solder the wire together, then when you're done, you have to cut the soldered junction off. And always, you lose a little bit of thermocouple wire every time you calibrate it. Those are all the questions I have, Mike. You want to check your windows if there's any. Just an A window if there's any others that came in that we haven't answered. Okay, for a water bath, what type of water would be best in reducing the uncertainty? So, um, I'd recommend going to NIT, uh, sorry, ACM. Uh, they have a very an E30, the a very nice guide on making a quality ice bath. Um, there be some web there that recommend it, but have recommendations. But distilled water basically is is the main point here. So laboratories who are really serious about this, they use distilled water only to make ice cubes or take the ice. And to mix with the ice, um, they let, they only allow the ice and water to come in contact with inert materials. Um, you don't handle it with bare hands; you use gloved hands. Um, and you even have to be careful about using certain plastics and stuff. I I remember all of the different kinds, but this is where your people are really serious about it um, and wanting to get uncertainties of like. 0 0.005 degree, achievable for sure, but you have to be very, very careful how you do that. 
Um, the question is, would you mind sharing a simplified software for determining the uncertainties of type S thermal couples? Um, for uh, uh, not sure if oh, uncertainty analysis in a spreadsheet. If, if you're if you're asking about um, the work we here, we copy of the spreadsheet that we used to put all these uncertainties together. Uh, don't have software that that will calculate uncertainties of. Uh, now, if you're talking about certainty of a best thermal specific type of thermal couple specifically, it, it's all uncertainty. I don't know of a, of a tool except for just going to the manufacturer and, and there. 